Welcome to this episode of Opportunity Matters. I'm Ken Tropshire, and today's conversation is on finance. Really what we want to look at today is, is access, opportunity, education, and look for what can be done and what's missing in terms of those who want access, need access in finance settings to have it. And we've got two great guests to, to help us through that. Uh, first, I'll introduce a former student, David R. Jones. He's the president and CEO of Castle Oak Securities, LP, a leading boutique investment bank with a broad offering of financial services, including equity sales and trading, fixed income sales and trading, and financial advisory services. Since founding Castle Oak Securities in 2006, Mr. Jones has overseen the substantial growth of the firm's business and, act and activities and personnel. David is a proud MBA graduate, served on the Wharton School Graduate Executive Board from 2012 to 2023, and brings over 30 years of Wall Street experience to today's conversation. And uh, as I said, most importantly, he's a former student of mine. David, welcome back. Hey, great. Good to be here, Ken. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, next is a, a longtime colleague. Uh, Professor Keith Weigelt. He's the Marx Darabov Family Professor Emeritus of Management. See, some of us don't even give credit to the people that paid for our chairs. I'm proud of you for doing that appropriately. <laughs> He's been a professor and a colleague at, of mine at Wharton for 36 years. Sounds like a bunch of old guys doing this finance conversation here. <laughs> he co-founded Bridges to Wealth in 2012 with a mission to close the wealth gap through evidence-based education and opportunity. The program empowers youth, parents, and community members with finance, financial and business life skills. So so really, and you can hear from the introductions, what we're going to do is really talk about the uh, the alpha and omega of, of finance, kind of a the entry-level space, what kinds of education can we provide. I mean, and often people talk about fi financial literacy, you know, as, and, and our dean here talks a lot more about financial fluency, like how do we get people to engage and understand finance a bit more. And then at David's level, and Keith can speak to this, these issues too, at the highest level, how do we get more access to people that don't traditionally have access to the highest levels of finance in places like investment banking, private equity, access to capital and the like. So, so that's, that's the goal of the, today's conversation. And... I'll start off with, with you, David. If, if you could just, just talk some about your thoughts on the racial wealth gap and how that fits in with today's economic landscape and the issue. I, I mean, I think, you know, when I think about the, the, the racial wealth gap, you know, and I think about the economy, the U.S. economy, um, and this gap, obviously, we know the, the social injustice that that happened over generations that, that, that caused this. Um, we always talk about, we want the economy to grow. And, and, and those are, when they talk about it, they don't really kind of take how we're going to grow. And they talk about, you know, more money being the economy and businesses growing and, and, and um, things, but the, those injustices, those disparities um, are a problem in terms of not having full participation in the economy to help grow it. Um, and when you, you don't have that in terms of, um, Folks who uh, have uh, the, you know have been disadvantaged for a long time, and and you know things like the home ownership and income and savings and investments that really you know help drive the economy. And then when the economy slows down, those things hold people back. You really have a cycle of folks that aren't really participating. So I always think about sort of this gap uh, and how it impacts the economy. But also, if we want to fix it, we've got to sort of raise that. You know the the disadvantaged folks, the historically disadvantaged um, groups, to help make the economy you know much more stronger. I, you know, I do think about it. I think about it, it's a, it's a you know a cycle that that we got to get out of because if you you know if you the unemployment rates um, you know cause people that don't have the wealth or the substance to you know get out and you know survive through that, through, through the economy. It's just a perpetual cycle, not access to the education, the healthcare, all that um, is, is, is wrapped up into that. And you can kind of take it all apart, but 
in, in a nut, you know, that's that's why I think about sort of this this gap and how it's really affecting the economy and getting the economy going. Yeah, yeah, David, it, it is really really something. And one of my um, uh, team members, um, Maddie, she she said, you know, be sure you talk about these foundational issues about why the wealth gap exists and the structural issues that are there that, for example, prevented home ownership, that that prevented access to capital to invest in businesses to start business. And, and I don't care the, the ethnicity or the religious background or or, or the, the, the citizenship level of, of wherever it is, if you haven't been able to to, to accumulate capital over generations, you're in a different position than somebody who has done so for a long period of time. And they, and they talk about it in terms of, you know, they want to make sure people know now when you talk about income versus wealth, right? You know, right. And people, oh, I got a good job and I get paid every week. And that's, that's not, you know, that's a component. But in terms of the, the, the wealth creation and the stability it creates within a, within a, a household, within communities, is very impactful, and I, you know, I'm not smart enough, or you know, to say, and grasping, you know, for um, the generations, the centuries that those injustices took place, and how that, is, you know, how, how how long does it take to get out of that? And that's what I was talking about, sort of the it's it's a it's a it's a cycle that people are in, and you know, again, I don't have the answer, but it's a real problem, this racial wealth gap. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the things that, that, that I do is to uh, work with athletes. And, you know, it's almost a, a foundational conversation with some of them when they're making, you know, they, they get a sign and bonus of a couple of million dollars. And they might accidentally use the word, I'm we wealthy. I said, no, you, you, are, you are rich in this moment, but you, are, you don't have wealth. You can have wealth. You, you can work to have wealth. But there's some more steps to that. And, and by the way, your wealth it's going to be difficult for you to, to catch up with the wealth that some others have had for for generations. So th th this is a perfect lead into the man who created Bridges to Wealth, <laughs> Professor Professor Keith Keith Weigel. So Keith, why, why don't you talk some about the, the work that you you've done? Sure. And and why you do it, and how it ties in with this kind of this 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 foundation that we've we've begun to lay here. Sure. Well. Ken, since you've already revealed my age, <laughs> I will uh, confirm it by saying that I'm really a child of the civil rights movement, and that was my big first social movement. So I go back to that point. And in uh, 1963, Martin Luther King uh, gave a fairly famous speech called Why We Can't Wait. And in that speech, he said, speaking of white Americans, they have deplored prejudice, but tolerated or ignored economic injustice. And so if we look at that, when he made that speech, and we look 60 years forward to like where we are today, we can ask ourselves, what has changed in those 60 years? The biggest thing that has changed is a wealth gap continues to grow almost monotonically. And we talk about the wealth gap, but most people don't understand how big the wealth gap is. Based on the 20, you know, 20 census, if we look at white households, the median wealth of white households is a little bit over $187,000. The median wealth of black households is equal to $14,000. Again, you know, that's way more than 10 times. And again, this wealth gap continues to uh, grow. So why we're decreasing the income gap, we're not doing anything with the wealth gap. And I would claim that since Martin Luther King made that speech in 1963, that black households are even in a, a worse position. So, so it's interesting, you, you, you raise this in the way that you do. You think about, you know, a lot of the... Uh, controversial DEI conversation now is about access to jobs. And th that's just the tip of the iceberg of the problem. The idea of, of getting, having some regular revenue, getting a salary, 
or you get even a big salary it is not really what's at, at the heart of the problem. So you, you've identified this household number that's at a national level that's problematic. And one of the issues we should be addressing, and many people are, are taking a lot of approaches at, at it, is how to, how to close that gap. Right. And the other thing with wealth that, that we want to re, uh, remember, right, if you look at society as a network, Okay, and we look at the wealth disparity. The wealth disparity hole is a central node. And what I mean by that is it causes all these other disparities in our society. So there's growing and growing evidence that says that the health of a household depends on the wealth of the household. So if we have a wealth gap, we have a current health gap, which is going to get bigger. And again, we, and we've seen this in COVID where minority households were affected significantly worse. We have an education disparity. Low wealth households do not have as many resources to spend on their children's education. We have an, a home own, ownership disparity. Home ownership is one way you can grow wealth. We have a criminal justice disparity because low wealth households do not have the resources to you know, fight the uh, criminal system. So again, wealth is really, really important. And I think that's why this program fits in with the vision of Dean James and the vision of her coalition about using business practices to really transform people's lives. And again, uh, in our program, we have uh, empirical evidence showing how we have transformed people's lives. Yeah. So, I, so, I, so I do. Let, let's let's move away from the, the the dismal state of things, and let's talk about some of the uh, affirmative steps that that we can take and have taken um, at at these two two different levels. And I, I think it's it's fascinating to think about this first the the entry level kind of educational level to kind of bridge a path to wealth. And, th and, and then, David, I want to come back to you and talk about access to your business and access to um, these, y you know, one of, one of the things that, that, I, that I often talk about, too, is, is th thinking about real, real money, big money, money at levels that, that, that's just unimaginable uh, unless you've been exposed to it. One, one of the, uh, one of my favorite colleagues here at, at Penn in, in my long period of time here was, uh, Professor Elijah Anderson, and I used to go to, to lunch with him once a week. He's a sociologist, and I'm this you know business school person. We kind of exchange ideas, and he said to me once, "You know what? I got the answer to all these problems. It won't happen tomorrow, but this is the answer. The answer is is in one word." And I'm I'm at the edge of my seat waiting for him to say. It. He says the answer is exposure. That it, if we can expose groups that don't know about these things at the earliest ages, earliest generations, and continuously do it, we'll get some movement. So I always think about that, that exposure uh, uh, kind of idea. But let, let, let's talk about what, what you do, Keith, and, and then David, I want to come back and talk about exposure uh, in, in, into your business. What, talk talk about the practical way that you provide the education. Sure. So Bridges to Wealth is a uh, community-based program. It's a unique program. No other business school has a program like it. And basically, what we do is we go into the community. We give we we give them basic education at both the high school level and the adult level, and then we give them opportunities to help them put what we taught them into practice. And this long-term engagement is really, really important. So we encourage people. We can show how people are changing their financial behaviors and uh, so forth. And I just want to say business schools have a responsibility. They're in a very unique pos position because, first of all, we have the knowledge on how to show people how to generate wealth. And we're in a unique position to create what I would call this community wealth ecosystem, which is a, a public-private partnership, and that's exactly what the dean and her team is doing. So talk about, let, let's, so you go to the communities and, and you'll go, you do it at different levels, so, so kids, parents, and 
in one of its forms, how do you get them to understand this this path to wealth, or at least at least a greater positioning than they have? Give, just talk about the, the practical. Sure. Things. So again, it's very simple rules. Again, so most people uh, they overestimate how difficult it is to be wealthy, especially in the market. I'm still overestimating, but <laughs> so first we show them sort of you know how to generate wealth. Uh, you know, and then we give them very, very simple rules. And one thing you want to understand is we have a, our competitive advantage over any financial service company is that we're not selling anything. We don't charge for our program, none of our services, and people trust us. I started with uh, churches. We started, you know, going to churches. Uh, the word has spread, and people see they're investing dollars growing. So, so at, a, at a basic level, one path may be to introduce communities that have never seen index funds, for example, to say you, you take a small amount of money and now a lot of these um, uh, uh, investment firms allow you to, to invest you know, a dollar. as little as a dollar. Yeah. And you say, I'll show you how to do this. And, and, it, and it can be, um, and the main people listen to this may say, it can be a frightening experience to say, Wait a minute! How, I'm in the stock market. How how do I do this? So so it's that kind of again. This is Elijah Anderson said. It's the kind of exposure and how to do this, and they get to see how it how it grows along the way. So so so, so David, you're at the, at the at this other level. You're 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 kind of in the world of those firms that that take in those those one dollars, um, and, and often it's much more than one dollar. What's the story to access in in your business and and to to the wealth that's available in, in, in your business. So, um, and, and keep that sound like a, a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, you know, when I look at sort of what we have here at Castle Oak, um, and, and, you know, I co-founded this 17 years ago and for individuals. Now we have, you know, 70 employees, five offices around the country. We've raised, over four trillion dollars for U.S. corporations, and we've got um, we trade a hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars in fixed income and equity securities every day. So I'll tell you, this um, is the alpha and omega from one dollar to two trillions of dollars. Okay, and, and it's 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 a it's a, a great business, and it's a two twofold. I am in that high finance world, but I'm also when I look at it, I'm a small business owner, and I'm a minority owned business owner. And so from the lens I look at is, you know, what you said, Ken, about exposure. I really do think about, and we focus on a lot here, uh, of, of, of giving back. And it's not just, you know, our treasure, our, our, our money, which we do a lot of that. I'll talk a little bit about that, but just our time as well, because our exposure, these kids just seeing me as a CEO of a company, seeing my management team that's. 85% minority or, or women that, that when we talk to these kids, we can see their eyes light up just to get them interested in, you know, what we're doing. Um, and so that exposure part, I, you know, Professor Elijah was, he's, he's correct on, on saying that, that we, we do focus on that. But um, one of the things also from what I look at when I came out of, of Warden, I think Wall Street itself, the investment banks, I think it's less sparse today than it was then with minority individuals in the in the c-suite levels um and part of that is is you know it's happened what's happened is their pipeline is kind of um you know dried up a little bit because i think it's it, you know they've got you know tech companies that are growing and paying a lot of money you got private equity guys that are hiring from the colleges and and mba programs now and a lot of kids are going the entrepreneurial route so that pipeline is is less, but what we're doing from day one after you know, you know, 17 years, but from day one, we've had an internship program. Um, and it was, you know, it started just as a summer internship program. Uh, now we, we focus on our, you know, our analysts, you know, one and two year analysts here, but we feel we're helping to increase that pipeline. You know, it's very small. We know Wall Street's got right. a lot of folks. We're a small company. But trying to give that exposure and that training to uh, folks who, who don't have that might not get that opportunity anywhere else. And I, you know, Ken, I will tell you, Ken and Keith, 
I will tell you, I've made some decisions on hiring at, at the end of the day on folks who I think, you know, might not get that opportunity. You know, if it's a, if it's a, uh, if it's a tie, it's like, we might have to say this, this one kid might not get another opportunity to get exposed to this business and excel. And, um, and so that's what we're doing in terms of internally here. You know, I mentioned our, our, our money give back because we leverage we try to leverage our give back into organizations that are have that same mindset we have. So we have three pillars. It's um, education, and I don't, you guys probably know I have scholarships set up at 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 Wharton and uh, and my undergrad Boston University focused on finance, focused on people of color, uh, and I also uh, so it's education, professional development, as well as um, community impact, and those are the areas we sort of want to put our dollars to kind of leverage it with organizations that sort of can do and help give that exposure or get, you know, a diverse group of talent, you know, looking at, looking at this business. You know, one of the things that, that you reminded me of, David, is we've got some other programs here at, at Wharton that, that try to do some of this exposure work too. We, we're, um, in the leadership of, of Alt Finance, which is a, a, a combination of, of uh, companies working with Wharton to expose, uh, at this point, traditionally uh, historically black colleges and universities to the alternative finance business. And, and again, I think about you know even my undergrad days at Stanford University. I didn't know anything about investment banking or. or it, I think those kinds of things existed in, in the 70s, didn't they? But I, but I didn't know anything. You know, I, I wish I had had, as, as, an, as an econ major, I just wasn't in the orbit of understanding this, this higher finance kind of, uh, kind of opportunities that exist. So, so this, is, this really is the, the bookend piece to, to the work that, that Keith is doing. And we've got some other professors, too, that are starting to do some of this, this kind, of, kind of work. And I just want to throw out, a wild card, card kind of question, and then kind of allow you both to close out with with uh, w whatever big takeaway you make sure people uh, uh, have. Um, AI, I mean, how can AI uh, help in this space? Just in kind of a a thirty second thought of, of things you'd you'd like to see, or that you think AI could do. Or people should think about as AI invades everything that we do. I, I'll, I'll start. Exactly. That's a double-edged sword, and it's sort of like the uh, uh, evolution of the internet. It it, it can be a equalizer, uh, uh, something that can level the playing field um, if utilized correctly for all all folks. But it also could be very bad if we don't have if folks don't have access to if certain groups don't have access to that. And it's the same like, as I talk about the internet. So if, you know, one of my things is that we need to make sure that, you know, all people have access to the internet and technology. And so AI is going to be a very, very powerful game changing, you know, way of, of the way we live. And if only certain groups get access to that, that's going to be a major problem. And, and, and Keith, that's your closing thought, David. Keith, in your 30-second uh, uh, closing thought. I just want to point out that our audience in our our participants, if you look at them, right, 20% of them receive incomes lower than 20000 Over 50% receive incomes less than 40000 So, again, you know, people have this mistaken notion that you need lots of, you know, money to start your path to wealth, and that's not true. And the other thing is 73% of our participants are women. And empirically, women are actually better at investing than men are. But if you ask women, nine out of 10 women say that men are better. So part of, so, you know, part of our job is to, again, create visions that people can see a path going forward. Like, I've had more than one family thank me for showing them a path out of poverty because they didn't know how to do it. It's not like people don't want to get out of poverty. They just don't know how to do it. I think we've laid out a lot in terms of the opportunities that exist to, to move forward, to provide more opportunities in finance for those who have not traditionally had access. So please join us for the next episode, and thank you to you both. 
uh, of Opportunity Matters. I'm Farida Griffith, Managing Director for the Wharton Coalition for Equity and Opportunity. In partnership with Wharton Works, led by Professor Damon Phillips, Business Roundtable, and Second Chance Business Coalition, we're bringing together business leaders, academics, state leaders, and justice-impacted communities for discussions on creating pathways to sustainable employment for individuals who are formerly incarcerated. To learn more and register, go to ceo.wharton.upenn.edu.